just chopping vegetables making dinner for all the children like even like any normal day and that's when the knock on the door um i was all just all happy opened the door and there was two police officers and i just said oh hello would you like to come in and he just said well hope um fennel is your daughter yes and she said well um, I'm terribly sorry, and there's no easy way to say this to you, but Hope was involved in the creation, and uh, I'm really sorry to say this, but she, she's dead. She, she was killed. And I just froze. I couldn't sit down, you know, and I was just running around getting Hope's pictures and saying, look, look, she's really young, she's really strong, she's alive. And that was it, my life was just destroyed. It just felt like everything. Um, everything I ever believed to be true and real and good just destroyed in a, in a second. And I was being asked to go and identify my child who apparently had a collision with an 18 ton truck. I mean, one minute you send your child to school, next minute you're sitting there and talking about she should be cremated or she should be buried. And, and I used to just, it just doesn't feel real. We all went to the coroner's. I was incredibly scared because what an 18 ton does to a child, the lorry was loaded at the time. And she was just lying there as if nothing happened to her. But she had this, uh, it was something, obviously she must have banged her head and her cheek. I looked at her and I just felt that I died, you know. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even give her a hug. Like, just hug her. So basically, I had to just stand there. Literally, they put her, you know, because she's now an object of investigation, you know. But she's hope, you know. And the whole family was there, and her father was just destroyed. We just couldn't bear to look at her. And the fact that you can't touch her, she's your child. And we had to leave her there for three weeks. We couldn't touch her. We couldn't look after her, you know. Um, and this is the legal procedures and you can't do nothing. Your child is suddenly not your child. It's a piece of evidence. Basically what you need is the truth. Yeah, that's the least you can have. You can't have your child. At least you want the truth, what happened? The responses weren't really clear. Um, they were straightforward um, and they weren't telling me what I needed to know. Um, they said that it was just a terrible accident, it was a terrible tragedy, that I unfortunately was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know if you can hear all the victim blame there. She was in the wrong place, in the wrong time. Not an 18 ton lorry driving through a school area. And she was a very, very sad incident. It was just a tragedy, which means it couldn't be helped. It just happened. Nobody was responsible and we shouldn't. And you know, they were just gonna close the case then. I knew there was more to it. So I decided to pursue it. They kept saying she was there, wrong place. Maybe she was drunk. She never drank. So they took blood samples on her, which are trying to prove that she might have been drunk. Immediately, uh, the driver was devastated. I mean, that was the focal point that he was devastated. You know, nobody talked about my child being squashed under a lorry. You know? And he was very cooperative and he did everything he could. And I said, no. I said, I want this investigated properly. I wrote five pages of questions for the police, from the size of the lorry to the distance between the mirror to the, where Hope was, to the, where Mike was, and where the bike got spat out, and where Hope was, you know. 
basically they say is that um, she approached the crossing. Uh, she went to cross, the traffic was stationary. Uh, a lorry was stationary because it wasn't moving in complete fate. She just went to cross. It was basically decided it was an accidental death due to blind spots. That was the only reason, you know. And they tried to close the case again. Um, so I pursued the police uh, and I actually more or less demanded an investigation into his phone records. He was actually having a fight with his girlfriend. So um, they were just having a, you know, argument. He was paying no attention. I had a right to no information for two and a half years. Two and a half years, you know why? To protect the driver, his rights. Uh, I had no rights at all. So they left me with this word, trapped. She was trapped. And as I do a lot of PTSD. Uh, I would have nightmares and just wake up screaming, where was she trapped? How long she was trapped? 25 minutes. She actually died by suffocation, asphyxiation. She wasn't dead when she went under. Her hair was tangled up in the eggs when they under because she had black hair down here. Beautiful, you know. And her hand was under one of the wheels. Apparently just a little hand sticking out. There's something really, really wrong with British justice and CPS. When it comes to road crime, uh, it's treated like nothing. The killing of Hope Fennell is not an isolated incident. Of the 23,500 road casualties in 2016, over a quarter were children. In the same year, drivers killed over 40 people walking on a pavement or a verge. It's a level of carnage that results in surprisingly little public outrage. George Monbiot is a journalist and author. If you want to kill someone, the best way to do it is in a car, because you are highly likely to get away with it. One of the reasons for that is that people are being killed by cars all the time. Um, we tolerate a level of killing by cars that we don't tolerate in any other area. If as many soldiers were killed in combat every year on, in UK wars, we would be up in arms. We would be outraged, horrified, astonished. We would demand government action. But when it comes to people being killed by cars, we just accept this as part of the ordinary course of life and death. Well, it's time we stopped accepting it. It is unacceptable. But we have become so inured to the daily tragedies caused by cars and other vehicles that we no longer recognise them as avoidable and preventable, which is what they are. We woke up nice and early that day and it was beautiful, it was sunny like this and um, we all sat here on the boat and we looked in the garden and we saw a rabbit and uh, we looked at the rabbit for a bit and Eddie and I had a coffee um, and then he bounded off the boat, off to his motorbike and set off for his journey. He was about 20 minutes into his journey um, and the three lanes of traffic on the M4 started to slow to a stop. Um, Eddie had just stopped and the VW transporter van smashed straight into him. The driver wasn't looking. The police think his attention was away from the road for between nine and 16 seconds. Even he admits he never hit the brake. Eddie was thrown from his bike. He um, went over the car in front and he was brain dead pretty much on arrival at hospital. He took nine days to die. You have to wait a long time um, for coma medication to leave the system before you can be pronounced brain dead and have life support withdrawn. So we waited nine days. He went for organ donation and, and he was dead. My husband was incredible looking. He was young and I spent a lot of time at the funeral home where his body was being stored. I'm thinking, how can a man still with his summer tan 
and his biceps still kind of pumped from whatever exercise he'd done the day before. How can he be lying there as a corpse? And I remember thinking, I'm 34, and my son is at home playing in the paddling pool, and I'm staring at my husband's corpse in a coffin. Because someone smashed into him on the M4. And that is only the tip of the iceberg of the horror. It kind of carried on from there. It all went overnight. He had no dad. He lost his second language just because someone wasn't paying attention to the road. And I think there's this assumption that, oh, well, it won't happen to me. It happens to other people. I'm a really good driver. I've got really good reflexes. I've got a really fast response time. You haven't. Nobody has. For the first three months, my mind was 100% occupied with making sure that the right charge was given to the driver that killed my husband and my son's father person you love the most has been killed and they're going to be failed by the system. I don't know how you carry on with your life when you feel that there's been an injustice against your person twice, <laughs> not just once, twice. You go into this weird state of fighting for your loved one and for me it worked out as well as it could. The driver got charged with the appropriate charge, he pled guilty, but for many families that isn't the case and it's a, li it's a living hell. Amy Aaron Thomas is the Advocacy and Justice Manager for Road Peace, the national charity for road crash victims. Amy explains how the law treats victims of road violence. But they're still very much second-class victims. Not only are they second-class to defenders who have many more rights than do victims, but just compared to other victims of crime, you know, it's like our government doesn't define homicide as including criminal road death. Uh, so, you know, a driver of a speedboat can be prosecuted for a uh, homicide, manslaughter, but a driver of a, a drunk, uh, speeding driver trying to evade police, well, that's just causing death by dangerous driving. And that means, uh, you know, the, if it's not manslaughter, it's not homicide, the family doesn't get a homicide caseworker, so we really are seen as second-class uh, criminal deaths by the justice system. They're not allowed even the return of the body of the deceased until the any suspect drivers had their rights, uh, you know, problems around um, post-mortems. These can go on for months or years before there's a criminal trial. So it's so dragged out and families are really held hostage by our justice system. We're way behind other countries when we tack or with tackling hit and run. They'll have a knowingly leaving the scene of a fatal or serious injury collision. We don't. We just have a simple fail to stop. It's a summary offense. It applies if you hit a, another car or a tree or if you leave someone dead. George Monbiot again. Our tolerance of the domination of the car and our tolerance of the huge amount of deaths and injuries caused by the car are uh, two sides of the same coin. They, they are intimately connected. My mother Elizabeth had come to stay with me and my family. My twin sister Victoria had given birth to her new baby boy um, two days beforehand and we were all really excited to go and visit the new baby. And we were on the pavement when a bus instead of turning right into the depot, tragically um, drove straight onto the pavement. I should think he went from about naught to 60 in about three seconds. Um, very sadly, my mother was um, slammed up, ag up against the wall and she was killed. Um, my daughter was flung through the air and um, she lost her leg. It was just sort of hanging from a sort of shred of skin at the time. But it was awful for me because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't help because unfortunately I was on, my left leg was under the bus and I'd banged my head against the wall and I was slipping in and out of consciousness. But out of one eye I could see my mother who's dying and my daughter having lost her leg. Her leg was hanging off. And um the hardest thing is I do remember it quite vividly. Um, and I then remember 
a lot of shouting and panic and the ambulance is arriving. Um, the weeks and the months were dreadful. I mean, it's hard to understand how terrible that sort of trauma is, but I think the thing about road deaths is they are so sudden and nothing can prepare you for losing someone. I think people need to understand more the trauma of a sudden road crash and the impact that it has on you and also having to combine that trauma with a police investigation and probably a criminal case. It is a whole terrible mess of emotions and work that you have to do to try and make your life sort of resemble what it was before. But I think what we have to realise is that when road crashes happen, people's lives have been changed forever. Today, we appear numb to the 1.25 million deaths that occur on the world's roads every single year. Kevin Watkins is chief executive of Save the Children. This is now the single biggest killer of children in developing countries between the age of 10 and 19. It's the second biggest killer of children between the age of 5 and 10. So it's not an issue we can turn our backs on. For as long as there have been cars, drivers have been causing death and serious injury. In the 1920s, cars were a relatively new phenomenon, and the public reacted to a soaring death toll with natural outrage. Newspapers labelled killer drivers as remorseless murderers and likened the threat they posed to an epidemic disease. In Detroit, angry mobs would drag dangerous drivers from their cars. Two huge safety parades featured wrecked cars occupied by bloodied mannequins, drivers dressed as Satan, and thousands of children dressed as ghosts, each representing a road death that year. The processions were followed by grieving mothers wearing a white or gold star to indicate the loss of their child. The car makers tackled a looming PR disaster head on, spinning the story that pedestrians hit by cars were at fault through their own carelessness or guilty of the newly coined offence of jaywalking. A culture of victim blaming was born and a fallacy that road deaths are unavoidable accidents persists to this day. Christian Walmer is a transport journalist and author Ever since we've had a Ministry of Transport, which is just after the, the First World War, that ministry has always been dominated by people whose main interest is in furthering the idea that cars are the key form of transport. That has by and large continued for the last hundred years. And we need a rethink about that. We actually need to think, you know, what is transport for? Uh, is the terrible death toll we have on the roads, uh, you know, worth the, the, the cost of this emphasis on cars? Dr Ian Walker is Senior Lecturer in Psychology at the University of Bath. Another strange thing about the way that we as a culture view road danger is not only do we view it as this external force that just happens, uh, we also then expect the victims to be the ones to do something about it. Uh, now, in any other situation, if one person is harming another, we expect the person who's creating the danger to fix the problem. We don't demand that the person being harmed takes action. We don't address child abuse by making children um, protect themselves from adults. We deal with the perpetrators. And yet when it comes to motor danger, we're really bad at seeing that and we don't deal with the perpetrators. We put too much emphasis on the victims. Dr Rachel Aldred is a reader in transport at the University of Westminster. We need to look at why we've created a society where children uh, is not seen as safe for children to play in their own streets because of motor vehicles. It's not seen as safe to ride a bike, you know, really basic, normal, enjoyable activity because of the risk of motor vehicles um, injuring people. So we need to sort of change that lens and look at the source of danger rather than saying what did the victim do wrong. Children used to be able to row 
used to be able to use the streets around their homes and further afield as kind of an extension of their front yard. And now that really doesn't happen anymore. And the effect is particularly profound on children in low income households that maybe don't have any outside space, any garden of their own, and often their own street is, is barred to them now. Dutch transport infrastructure is now the envy of the world, but it wasn't always so. Post-war Netherlands saw a nation with a strong cycling tradition take to the car en masse. The price was heavy. The Netherlands earned itself the dubious title of most dangerous place in the world for child traffic casualties. By 1971, road deaths had reached 3,300 every single year. Among the 450 child victims that year was six-year-old Simone Langenhof, who was killed by a speeding driver as she cycled to school. The events that followed Simone's death were depressingly familiar at a time when 25 children a day were being injured by vehicles. The driver received a paltry fine equivalent to £20, Simone's mother suffered a nervous breakdown and the marriage fell apart. The family's life was shattered. However, Simone's death was different in one respect. Her father was Vic Langenhof, a journalist at Die Zeit, a Dutch daily newspaper. His grief and anger prompted him to write a full-page article entitled Stop de Kindermord, Stop the Child Murders, Langenhoff called for the formation of a group to break through the apathy with which the Dutch people accept the daily carnage of children in traffic. Stop de Kindermut's first president-elect was Marcia van Putten, a student and mother who went on to serve as an MEP. Well, it was a remarkable time because it was not that long after the Second World War, of course. And, uh, Amsterdam was in a poor condition in some areas. So there was a lot of rebuilding, the, the underground was built, and there was the mood, we're going to change the things. That in the first place, and in the second place, I think it was an, an issue of safety in the, on the roads, was recognized by all. It was not something like, you know, you say the Green parties are left or the right wing or whatever. It was not, not captured by any political party. It was a mood that everybody had. It was and especially after the death of the daughter of a famous journalist, put on front of that national paper, stop the kingdom war, and he had the figures about how many kids on their way to school were killed in traffic. The group cycled to visit the Dutch Prime Minister unannounced one Saturday morning. So we organized um, with this the committee and we asked our friends, etc. I think we were a group of maybe 30, 40 people, kids on bikes, on the bikes of the parents. And we started here around the corner in the center of Amsterdam. And we, uh, he lived a little bit in a sort of suburb, a nice green suburb. But we all went to the front door of the prime minister. Well, he himself, he opened the door. There was not a servant or something, Saturday morning. He later on came out to, to give the kids some sweets, etc. So, um, and we had a discussion for about 20 minutes. And um, he said, OK, you come to my, our, our office as a committee later on. And we did. I was also part of a committee in the ministry to design new living areas, what we called the Wong Erf. And it was totally different, uh, in a different design in a new way, with the bumps in the road. There was bumps, you can't drive too quick. Um, cars couldn't go through the area straight. You had to make sort of bows around big blocks with trees in it and flowers. The Dutch have 33 to 35,000 kilometers of dedicated cycling infrastructure. 70% of all urban streets in the Netherlands have a speed limit of 30 kilometres per hour and traffic calming measures are widespread. The result is that people of all ages and abilities are able to walk and ride their bicycles in safety. Most children travel to school by bicycle. Those too little to pedal are ferried serenely by cargo bike. 
Today, the Dutch own slightly more cars per head than the British, but they're less likely to use them for short journeys in urban areas. 27% of all trips in the Netherlands are by bicycle. Here in Britain, that figure is 2%. Eric Tetero is Senior Cycling Policy Advisor for the Ministry of Transport and the Environment in the Netherlands, the UK is in some sense 50 years behind the Netherlands if you look at uh, what we have achieved in those 50 years and what you're facing now. You're still facing a very high number of casualties, which you're also facing like we had in the, uh, in the 70s, our problem with the oil crisis. We are now, but it's globally, we're dealing with the climate. And the climate issue also uh, urges for uh, um, less uh, carbon dioxide, less car use and more alternatives like cycling. Wim Bott is National and International Public Affairs Officer for the Fietsersbond, the main advocacy organization for cyclists in the Netherlands. For us it's clear that we must uh, further reduce the speed of cars in cities. There is no real room for cars in cities. They are not made for cities. Cities are not made for cars. So we must uh, make more of the, of the space available to pedestrians and cyclists. And I think we can do that when we go back to 30 kilometers, 20 miles, that is, I think, per hour everywhere, except the main, some main roads. And then also enforce this with uh, systems of intelligent speed assistance in cars. Foreign observers, uh, they notice that uh, the behavior of car drivers in the Netherlands is better than in their own country, and certainly than Britain. I think it has to do with uh, the fact that cycling is part of everyday culture in the Netherlands. It means that most car drivers will cycle themselves, or they will have cycled as a child, or they will have their children cycling. So they know that there are cyclists everywhere and that they have to notice them when they are driving their car. Andrew Davis is chief executive of the Environmental Transport Association. The Dutch model offers a glimpse of what is possible. The systematic approach to road danger reduction improves life for everyone, whatever their age, however they travel. In addition to causing tens of thousands of road deaths and injuries, motor vehicles are damaging us all. 800,000 people each year die prematurely in Europe from breathing dirty air contributed to by diesel vehicles. Kevin Watkins again. Well, there are two very distinct types of road danger that affect children. The first of them is the most obvious one. It's being hit by a car and hurt by a car and in the worst case is killed by a car. The second danger is the less visible one, which is the danger that comes with air pollution. And the World Health Organization estimates that around one in every five child deaths that happen every year are a direct or indirect consequence of air pollution. Professor Stephen Holgate is Professor of Immunopharmacology and Honorary Consultant Physician at the University of Southampton. Well, we know here in the United Kingdom, for example, that we have the highest prevalence of asthma in Europe. And one of the major drivers for that, of course, is exposure to air pollution. The other thing that we understand is that, more recently especially, is that some of the air pollutants get into the circulation and start increasing the risks of developing diabetes, for example, which we know is going up in this country at the moment, and also uh, impaired cognition, learning, and the ability to acquire knowledge from schooling and teaching. So all of these factors come together and uh, make us think that air pollution is a much more serious thing than we ever thought it was. George Monbiot again. And there are so many better ways than depending on the car for all our needs. The car makes us dependent, it makes us passive, it makes us unfit, it fills the air with pollution and it destroys social cohesion. Private transport has been put at the ideological centre of much of the political change in this country. Margaret Thatcher talked about the great car economy and talked about how um, if someone is 26 years old and finds themselves traveling by bus, they should deem themselves a failure. It's an extraordinary thing. This is a highly ideological that we had to move into our cars. Because of course, when you're in a car, you're kind of removed from society. In fact, society becomes an obstacle. Pedestrians, cyclists, speed limits, traffic calming, the law, they all become 
an, an obstacle to where you're trying to get to and what you're trying to do. So you begin to see society as being a problem. Whereas public transport grows out of society, reinforces society because you connect with other people. It's this extreme privatisation, this extreme individualism, this extreme atomization that we suffer from in the UK that um, is exemplified by our modes of transport, but also exacerbated by those modes of transport. I believe the car has profoundly changed society. There are those taking matters into their own hands. For many, many years, I have felt that uh, non-car owners, who people who don't have cars, are not allowed to use the street, not allowed because it's car drivers who are allowed to park along the curbside, and we have no stake in the street. I applied to the council um, for a permit to, and I offered the same payment as parking a car, but to park a bench and flowers on the street that everyone could use. It was turned down, obviously. I therefore decided that I was going to show what you could do on a street in a parking space instead of a car. And I installed a people parking bay. So I put a bench and planters and I created a little gathering space and a little garden for people to sit down. The local community absolutely loved it. The council did try and evict it many times. Well, they did evict it many times and I had to move it to a different street. A thousand people petitioned to ask the mayor to allow the bay to remain within a year the council had agreed to launch a residential parklet programme, which meant that any resident could apply for a permit to install a parklet in front of their home and create a little community focus. Elsewhere, parents are demanding traffic be calmed for the sake of their children. I'm Jo, I'm a local parent, and when my kids started going to this school, I realised um, how dangerous it was. So kids are constantly in tension with the cars who are um, actually just shunting at them, waiting for them to get out of the way. And we have asked for the council to do some traffic calming, but they've rejected our first petition. It's taking too long and we want some urgent action. The succession of technological developments over recent decades, such as seat belts, airbags, anti-lock brakes and crumple zones, have reduced deaths on the road, but largely for those within vehicles. The faith placed in driverless technology as a way to protect the vulnerable may prove to be misplaced. Christian Walmer again. The new technology is put forward such as driverless cars, and people say, well, there's 1.25 million people killed on the roads uh, every year across the world. We will remove that danger and we'll remove it with this technology. I think there's two, uh, several things wrong with that. Just to give two of them. One is, uh, I'm not sure that these uh, driverless cars will ever be developed in the way that they're envisaged. I think there's all sorts of obstacles to that. Uh, but secondly, there's also no guarantee that they actually will be safe. They will still have software that is programmed by human beings. The, the cars will still be on the roads, kind of in potential collisions with people. One rapid way of uh, reducing the impact of uh, road accidents is to have fewer cars and then you'll have fewer road accidents. Dr Robert Davis is chair of the Road Danger Reduction Forum. We have to proceed by whatever means are required. People simply driving more carefully because it's socially unacceptable not to do so. Having the appropriate levels of law enforcement and deterrent sentencing. Engineering vehicles so that they cannot hurt, or kill or endanger other people on the highway. Uh, and engineering the highway so that people can move around without being endangered. Chris Boardman is an Olympic gold cyclist and currently Manchester's first ever commissioner for walking and cycling. He's been given 10 years to transform the city into one of the greenest in Europe. 
There's 250 million car journeys every year that are less than a kilometre. So that's like an easy 15 minute walk or a five minute bike ride. But they'll only get out of the car and do that if they can look out the window and go, ooh, I quite fancy that. So if you ask people what that looks like, they'll say, well, it's safe space, it's my own space. It's connected all the way from, from where I am to where I want to go. And everybody paints the same picture. We've just got to make space for them to do it. Again, the Netherlands seem more willing to implement bold changes. You see often in cities that uh, uh, the space is divided from the center. So first you start with providing enough space for cars, for buses, parking spaces, and what's left over is there for cyclists and for pedestrians. And we're now starting to do it the other way around. We're starting to think, okay, let's first make enough space for pedestrians for a very broad cycle path and then make a better solution for car parking. As people from Amsterdam have said, Amsterdam wasn't always Amsterdam. There's been a lot of changes that made Amsterdam more friendly for people walking and cycling. The solutions are simple and well proven, but they require political will and money. Nobody in the UK has any problem with the destination. So if you take them and stand them in Copenhagen, for example, where more than 50% of kids ride to school uh, every single day and 40% of all journeys are by bike, they go, yeah, I really prefer this. So everybody agrees on that. It's how you actually get from this car-centric society we can see behind us to, to a more people-focused uh, streetscape. Um, and that's the challenge, because what you're talking about is culture change. And it has to happen slowly and it's going to be painful. So what we'll do is we'll create examples, you know, in streets and roads like this, we'll create examples and we can show the effect and we can measure how people feel about it uh, and just show that actually people prefer this. And that gives politicians the confidence to go and put it in place. So we've already got a draft of the entire network for all of Greater Manchester of safe space for people to cycle and walk, fully connected from where they live to where they want to go. And that is a thousand mile uh, network and it's, it's the biggest in the UK. And that's what it takes. It needs connected big thinking to get people to change the way they travel. We shouldn't be slaves to the car, the car should be slaves to us. And uh, that would actually turn around our way of thinking about streets uh, in that we would give priority to, to human beings and not uh, the cars. What kind of society do that to their vulnerable, to their children? You know, and accept it and, and let it happen again and again. We've got to become much more focused on delivering real change basically taking space away from motor cars and giving it to people and putting us back in charge. Vic Langenhoff signed off his article Stop the Kindermord with a plea to the Dutch people. He wrote, this country chooses one kilometre of motorway over a hundred kilometres of safe cycle paths. There's no pressure group. Let's start one. Unite.